Good morning. This is Pastor Tom Mullins. I'm the pastor of Lexa and Marvel United Methodist Churches here in Phillips County, Arkansas. This is our daily devotional and prayer time as I come to you and try to be here with you and to share with you our scripture uh, for um, the uh, for the day as we read a chapter a day. We are in the book of Judges. We've read uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke. We've read from Acts to Revelation in the New Testament. The uh, 150 Psalms of the of the Book of Psalms in the Old Testament, and then uh, started back at the very beginning in the Book of Genesis. We've done Genesis and shared uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, it's one of those things. That, and then Joshua, and uh, now we are in the Book of Judges, as we started yesterday, and uh, we we're sharing this on Facebook Live as well as trying to do. Um, to make that available to you on YouTube as well. I'm still kind of learning and I, I appreciate the uh, learning curve as I try to be more um, uh, useful as, as far as using the, uh, the uh, internet and the online presence. But I want to make sure that you all know that we uh, consider you a part of our congregation, a part of our church, part of our church's mission, of course, and uh, not in mission to you, but to be in mission with you, to help you uh, to know more about the Bible, to know as, as we go chapter by chapter. Uh, we've been doing this for about three years. It started in December of 2020 uh, and have gone back and forth and some different things, but we have moved along really well. And I, I enjoy it and am excited about the fact that I'm always learning new things as we do this. It's it's one of those things that keeps us kind of in context and keeps us a part of the Bible. As we, uh, as I bring to you and uh, approach you from the pulpit, uh, also want to have some background and different things like that. We are Wesleyan Methodist, or at least I am as far as that goes. And I think that our, most of our, our congregations, whether they have disaffiliated or whether they are still remaining, staying United Methodist, it's been a journey and uh, the thing is, there are more Wesleyans uh, and Methodists uh, that have gone into different uh, phases of their ministry and mission. And each church has its own local, uh, the, the importance of what it is and what it means to be a Methodist. And what it means, of course, to be a part of God's church, God's kingdom, and also a part of the, uh, the uh, uh, body of Christ that be, it goes way beyond any denomination or any uh, sign that we might have out in front of our church as well and all that. I am here in my office. Uh, this is my third day of trying to use the computer. Uh, it, it, the, the screen that I see kind of changes and does some different things and things pop up. And uh, I'll try to make that as least, as least distracting to me, but also I don't want it to be distracting to you from what we are uh, trying to do today. Our reading from the hymnal is Rise, Shine, You People. And I'm always kind of impressed by the fact that as we go uh, number by number, as chronologically through the, the hymnal, uh, discover songs that have really deep meaning that uh, it's unfortunate we don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, use them more uh, as far as our doctrine and a part of that. And it's always been that way, a hymnal, a book of discipline well the first thing is a bible book of discipline and a hymnal uh, as the circuit writers would do as they would go out into the frontier as the ministry of jesus christ to be able to approach those who wouldn't have communion regularly wouldn't be able to do the sacraments or weddings and different things we're kind of going through a, a, a structure of that now where we're trying to get back to the basics of what it means to be uh, an, an exhorter, of E X H O R T E R. Uh, an exhorter is someone who t reads the Bible, takes it from that, interprets it in a way that is uh, both primitive in its way that we reach back to the very beginnings of what it was to be a part of the Jesus movement in the first century. And uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the power that comes from that, the holiness, that God has had since the very beginning, but the fact that we uh, share in that now because of the gift that Christ has given to us. So we are very lucky to know that, uh, and I don't mean luck in the way of chance, but I mean luck in the way that God has seen fit, even though we are just a speck in the universe, 
uh, to be that we are important to God and that we are loved by God. So the love that he gives us is something that we need to share. And the thing is, I don't know, um, kind of in the idea of if you're a parent and you have more than one child, you think I could not love anything more than I do this one child that has come into the world that my child and then a second one comes and it's like amazing how that love grows and how it's like you think well I could not love anything better than these two children and different things and then it includes uh, you know a third child maybe comes along or a nephew or someone who is uh, either an orphan or, or uh, just doesn't have the parents or the parental guides uh, have lost their parents or something to that effect and then that that person becomes a part of that love triangle uh, that goes out and stretches out or that circle I guess the love circle would probably be the best way to describe that and then the next thing would be that uh, you know people that you know people that you care for people that you work with people that you have uh, church with that you have church services with the people that you have uh, mission and work on mission and ministry together with the thing is that circle continues to grow but the love never diminishes the love you have for one is two and three and four and that's how God's love grows and how it's a part of who we are as a part of the kingdom we are not waiting for some special day when the kingdom starts the kingdom is here the kingdom is here but there is so much more that is to be experienced as we move along uh, life's journey and, and we do all of those things so it's important to know and to be able to pray for one another to love one another uh, you know we may seem like there's highs and lows when we love people more at certain points and we love them less at others but the fact is it's like that love is not uh, it's not on a scale you just simply love people because you love them and, and it should always be that way sometimes we think uh, well we have control of that but I think it's amazing how uh, how love can kind of grab a hold of you and, and pull you into a relationship, into a, uh, a group setting, into a worship setting, into whatever it is uh, that life has to offer in different things and to resist, to resist putting limits on it because there is no limit to God's love and no limit to God's grace. And, uh, you know, we sometimes think, well, that person is, they, they don't do well they don't do right. They don't do um, the things they should. And, uh, you know, but that's between them and God. And I'm sure that if we can, by loving people and by caring for people, we heap coals on the idea of what it is about me first. I think that is the most horrible part of being a human is that we, we all have a tendency in different times in our lives where we go for me first. I, uh, uh, Bruce Bennett was the pastor at First United Methodist Church in Sheridan while I was just uh, to the outside of town uh, at uh, Center Grove, my first appointment. And uh, he said that he was doing a Me First uh, like series of, of ministry, of, uh, I'm sorry, of sermons. And uh, in that, he, he showed a video, and uh, I can, just as vividly as I can, it was like a McDonald's type thing where, uh, or uh, maybe not not that Burger King, I guess, the, the you can have it your way kind of thing. And uh, the thing that I remember most is the one at the very end, and the little girl, and she's standing there with a, like a small Shetland pony, and uh, standing there, and she goes, they even gave me a pony, you know? And it's like, uh, me first, church, is uh, uh, kind of one of those, uh, it sounds ridiculous, but unfortunately, it it lives. It's it's true that uh, some churches and some places are like that. That they think that they are first, and it's all about them and their families and and all of that type of thing. When we are a weird type of organization, we are an organization dedicated to the idea of serving people outside of the congregation, our communities, and the world around us by helping them. And in the first century, the thing that made the ch the, the church of uh, church God's church, the church of God, church of Christ, made it so important, or was thought to be so they couldn't understand why these Christians were taking care of people that they weren't, weren't even a part of their faith, not a part of their families and groups. And uh, th at that time, and, and probably still today, is that we t tend to want to take care of our own and uh, and different things. And then back in those days. Uh, from what I've 
you know, read in class and stuff, uh, they talk about the idea that in ancient times, if you didn't have a son, uh, a daughter would cost you money because she had to have a dowry and to be married. And, and if you didn't have a good dowry and different things like that, it was hard for her to find her place in society. So uh, the pagans would take their uh, girl children that were weren't valuable they didn't consider them to have value and everything take them out and leave them out in the desert or out in the wilderness uh to be consumed or just to be you know and would would kill them that way and uh remarkably uh christians would take those girl babies and those girl toddlers and and, and uh different things that were considered a burden to the pagans and they would take them in take care of them raise them and then they became Christians and different things. So that's why, uh, you know, it was thought of as like, these people are just different. They go and they help the elderly or they visit people in prison and they do. And our history has been that. When we are at our best, when we are being the church of God, when we are being God's church and uh, uh, doing the things that God wants us to do and has commanded us to do, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And it's one of those things that uh, we often get off track. We often get off in ways that we think about how, um, you know, how does this benefit me? How do I figure this? And I think it's crazy how uh, it was brought up in a meeting talking about giveaway, like food and clothing and, and different stuff and giveaways that were free giveaways per se. And, and the fact that there's always someone who wants to try to make sure well, we want to make sure that this goes to the right person. We want to make sure this goes to the, the thing I think is good and, and the philosophy that I would like to share with you is that do what you are supposed to do, what God has commanded you, and let them deal with the fact if they mistreat or misuse or, or whatever it is that's being offered. Um, the offering is done in good faith. It's done in love and kindness. Uh, you know, I know uh, my mother always told me that if somebody, if, if she gave something to somebody and then they turn around and they sold it and made a profit or whatever, the thing was you gave it away. Once you made the transaction, once you had given it to them, it's up to them to decide what to do with it. And I think that uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that and the wisdom in the fact that it's like one of those things people uh, don't, you know, I encourage you not to try to hold on to or try to manipulate the gift that you give, whether it be love or kindness, whether it be monetary, whether it be uh, physical as far as like clothing or food or, or even uh, financial resources that you uh, distribute out to others, and you do it in love and you do it in kindness. It's great that God keeps a record of that. God keeps a record. You don't have to keep a record. You don't have to. It doesn't matter if that can of soup ended up in 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 uh someone else's home uh and and i I think a lot of that happens a distribution of things well well we got this rice but we really don't like rice or we really don't like beans say and we got that and we'll we'll pass it on to somebody who can fix that or make that or do that and i I think that it's a a spider web we may give it out to a hundred people but you're serving maybe five or six hundred in the sense and that's what god talks about the blessing that's manifold it's one of those things that uh, we're able to do that some people have uh you know a shyness about taking something that's free but the thing is we have to remember that not to put tethers to that not to make it where well you can give us this but that means you have to be poor or that means you don't have a house or that means you don't have a car or that you do have a car and it's like we're going to judge you for the fact you have a nice car that's probably paid off or somebody has given you or whatever it might be so uh just kind of putting that into perspective in a way that uh you know we didn't deserve what god gave us he gave us the opportunity and the hope of eternal life we were given that as as an act of grace from god when we do the sacraments, when we have baptisms, when we have Holy Communion, that's God's grace being extended to us as a remembrance of what God has done for us. It shouldn't be something that we hold back or that we try to 
to put tethers on it. Well, you know, you you haven't acted right or you made a mistake this week or whatever it is, and you're not worthy to be a part of that or part of our service or worship. Uh, you've made mistakes in the past. God erases those mistakes. It's not that we're not supposed to be aware and to take safety as a, as a very important thing and a very important part of who we are. But the fact is we must always remember that God's grace, God's protection, and God's love is always sufficient. It will make sure that everything happens the way it's supposed to. And uh, it's unfortunate humans, we we really mess things up a lot. We get it to where we just... Um, I don't know. We just can't. We, don't, we just kind of try to take control when we need to let go and let God. I love that that saying or that bumper sticker. So, if we let go, we let God. Uh, God will guide us, lead us, protect us, and all of those things around us. I don't know if you've noticed, like in the stories that we've read in the Bible, as we've read each one of them, it's like it's amazing how God can turn things completely around. Joseph. Not only was he a blessing in, in Potiphar's house when he was sold as a slave there, but then when he was in prison, it was like he was a blessing to the folks around him, to the both the, um, I guess you would call him the warden, and then the different ones that were administrating the jail. And the jail was did well, and it was doing the things it was supposed to and, and being blessed. And then he came to Egypt, came before the Pharaoh, and then all of a sudden, there was insight into what was about to happen. There was insight into putting the grain back and controlling that and to keeping things um, orderly. So he went from slave to prime minister, which he was still, I guess, technically a slave, but it was like one of those things that it was, uh, he was honored and respected and different things. So it, it's quite remarkable how, uh, when God enters into the equation, how things can become so much better. But we always, must remember to serve and to love others as well. Well, uh, that's kind of my pretext, I guess, for today. I, I, I kind of let the, the Spirit lead this, and I, I am so grateful for you uh, being a part of this as we we share uh, God's Word chapter by chapter. We're in the second chapter of Judges today. We'll be reading that and sharing that with you. And then, as I said, 187, which is here in the United Methodist Hymnal, and uh, I kind of want to share that as well. Uh, kind of chant, sing, read, uh, whatever it takes to to kind of get the words and, and, the, and the lyrics across to uh, to uh, to our our listeners and stuff. But also know that you're a part of this. If you have a prayer request or a concern, if you'll just let us know, we will make sure that that's kept uh, in uh, uh, in in our rotation or in our I don't know how that's not the right in our prayer list and being able to do that as well and again I want to thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to share with you whether you're watching this live or you're watching it at a later date or a later time uh, may God bless you for that okay dear Heavenly Father we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit as we come into your presence Wherever two or three are gathered in your name, we know that you are with us. And we are asking for that blessing upon us, our community, and our world. We pray for those who have suffered from violent acts of those who have committed uh, murder or, or gun violence or, or whatever situation that might be being faced. We want to pray for our, our folks in our church. We want to lift up Lanny and Delia this morning as we come to you in faith. And we also want to marry Hinesley to be able to lift her up and uh, also to uh, remember all of those who are suffering from injury or illness that they would be lifted up. We want to be able to thank you for all that you do. We thank you for the fact that uh, we have many of our members who have been 50 or 75 years amid the, uh, the changes and the chaos that is being God's church in a place that is uh, in, a, in a world that is, is sometimes harmful to the idea of loving and caring for one another. There's so much jealousy and so much things that go on that we just want to ask for your softening of our hearts and our minds, opening our hearts and minds to the fact that we are a people of God and we are one people. We are in unity with you in the love that is so important and so kind and so gentle to us. As we go to your word, we ask that you expand our minds and our thoughts, that we might be able to come up with the questions that are so necessary for us 
as we go along this journey to be able to answer those questions in the world and to be able to show by our witness and our service our love, grace, and kindness that has been extended to us that we share with others as well. We ask for your blessing upon this reading today, upon this from the hymnal and from your word. The scripture would go out into the world in ways that we would share it, not to beat others up with it or to quote and to, to uh, you know, and to quote out of context or whatever it might be. Help us to, to understand and discern and learn in ways that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are lost, those who are in need, and that they would be lifted up and comforted in their time of loss, their time of illness, their time of injury. But we also recognize and welcome you into our presence in our times of joy, the new birth of a child, the blessings that come from knowing that one of the saints has gone on to their great reward, and to the great reward of the triumphant church that is God's church in the heavenly places. We thank you on this day as we come into your house, this 13th day of September 2023, and we ask for your blessing upon us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our community, and our world, that we would be lifted up to know you as our personal Savior. Bless this time together, this reading of your word, and we do and ask all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rise, shine, you people. Christ the Lord has entered our human story. God in him is centered. Christ comes to us by death and sin surrounded with grace unbounded. See how he sends the powers of evil reeling and brings us freedom, light, and life and healing. All men and women who by guilt are driven, now are forgiven. Come celebrate your banners high unfurling, your songs and prayers against the darkness hurling. To all of the world go out and tell the story of Jesus' glory. Tell how the Father his Son, tell how the Father sent his Son to save us, Tell of the Son who life and freedom gave us. Tell how the Spirit calls from every nation, God's new creation. Rise, shine you people, Christ the Lord has entered. Sorry. Rise, shine, you people, Christ the Lord has entered our human story. God in him is centered. Christ comes to us by death and, him, and sin surrounded with grace unbounded. See how he sends the powers of evil reeling and brings us freedom, light, and life and healing. All men and women who by guilt are driven now are forgiven. Come celebrate your Brenner's high unfurling, your songs and prayers against the darkness hurling. To all the world go and tell the story of Jesus' glory. Tell how the Father sent his Son to save us. Tell of the Son who life and freedom gave us. Tell how the Spirit calls from every nation God's new creation. Amen. Alrighty, um, we are on chapter two in the book of Judges. Uh, I'm kind of excited because I know there's some upcoming stories uh, that we've heard maybe in Sunday school or maybe we've just heard told. And I think it's funny how the, um, the world of Hollywood tends to want to um, uh, kind of steal our stories are still are, are the stories of the Bible and uh, puts them in a new context or puts them in a different way of telling that story. So when you hear something that you read in the Bible, you think, well, I've heard that before. I've seen that. I heard that about that story before. And that's pretty amazing uh, how uh, even things in the world can tell back and kick back to the idea of what God's Word has to say. 
and the spirit of all of that. And I was going to say those two uh, interruptions there, that was uh, some kind of telemarketer from Kansas. I still have my Kansas exchange uh, number uh, from when I was in seminary several years ago. So uh, it's hard to believe I uh, graduated five years ago and uh, December will be 10 years ago that I graduated uh, from uh, Arkansas Tech University. We were talking about that yesterday. So so I, December of 2013 is when I graduated there. And, and then uh, this year, May, May of 18 is when I graduated from uh, seminary with my master's degree. So it's one of those things to have five and 10 year anniversaries kind of on top of each other and to be able to do that. Uh, I'm looking forward to, I'm planning uh, sometime soon to go down and see the Wonder Boys in Russellville, and see a, a game there. Uh, anyway, we are chapter two in the book of Judges, and I appreciate you again for being here and, and helping me to share this uh, with others. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Boshem and said, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you into the land that I had promised to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. For your part, do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my command. See what you have done. So now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become adversaries to you, and their gods shall be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the Israelites, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named the place Boshem, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. When Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites all went to their own inheritances to take possession of the land. The people worshiped the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So they buried, within, they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance in timnath Heris, in the land, in, in timnath Heris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaosh. Moreover, that whole generation was gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshiped the Baals. And they abandoned, they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were all around them and bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and worshipped Baal and the Astartes. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the power of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them to bring misfortune, as the Lord had warned them and sworn to them, and they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen even to their judges, for they lusted after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their ancestors had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. They did not follow their example. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord would be moved to pity by their groaning because of those who persecuted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they would relapse and behave worse than their ancestors, following other gods, worshiping them and bowing down to them. They would not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their ancestors and have not obeyed my voice. I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. 
in order to test Israel whether or not they would take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their ancestors did. The Lord had left those nations, not driving them out at once, and had, and had not handed them over to Joshua. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I, uh, I kind of find this interesting in the f sense that uh, in the past, when we've read and it talks about all the people are like, uh, all the people are considered together. And this, in Judges, that starts to break apart. Uh, all of a sudden, this group or that group or or this army or that army within the within the confines of the Israelites, uh, there are battles and the things that are going on. Before it was everything. God was establishing, uh, excuse me, God was establishing Israel as a people. And uh, this is the beginning of the end, I guess is how I would say it, as far as that goes. Of course, you know, the state, the modern state of Israel is different, uh, in my opinion anyway. It's different than what uh, God created when he brought the, the slaves and uh, folks out of, out of Egypt. Uh, slavery was different in that, in that place and time because of the fact that uh, it wasn't chattel slavery like we have in, in the south part of the United States or had in the south part of the United States. It's one of those things that this type of slavery uh, is something that has gone on throughout the Mediterranean since the very beginning in different places and different times throughout history. Uh, almost entire nations, were, were more, most of their populations were slaves or considered slaves that they belonged to the state or belonged to someone else. Whereas the idea that what God was trying to do or, and the people and God, what he did was truthful, but what the people did in order to like abandon that was the fact that God was creating a people for himself. He was creating them so that they would not only be just one people, but all people would be underneath the banner of God's, uh, God's rule, God's sovereignty. And uh, they lost that, and they, they, they continue to lose that. We, we don't tend to be uh, considered, uh, I mean, we, we have things that happen in the world places, um, and, and the world uh, you know, identifies as American, or as this and that. Uh, but the fact is that it's like, well, that's a, an Arkansas problem, or that is a Ohio problem, or that is a California or Missouri problem. And uh, it tends to kind of focus in on that. And that's kind of what's happening. Uh, you know, we, if you know American history, U.S. history, we were 13 different countries when we declared our independence. We were 13 different countries. And then we, we became one. And now we are up to, we were really created uh, the states that came after that uh, they were still in the same way, like the Commonwealth of Kentucky or the state of Ohio or, or the uh, Indiana or, or any of those places as you go farther west uh, beyond the 13 colonies that became the 13 states. Uh, it's, it's remarkable to see how uh, even though uh, we tend to think of it like, well, that happened up in Maine or that happened over in New Mexico, uh, we still tend to kind of do that uh, and, but I don't know that so much like before in, in the olden days is like people, I think that first or second generation, I guess is what you want. Second generation of folks that were like safer back for me for like back home in Ohio, uh, where I was born and raised the idea it was like the first they thought of themselves as English or part of the, the United Kingdom. And that's what caused the revolution and all that type of stuff. But then these 13 different groups uh, had their own identity and they had different ways of thinking about how, uh, what it meant to govern, what it meant to do and be that. And uh, the 12 tribes and the Levites and all that kind of thing, it's like there's always that, uh, that separation that they would say that I am a Judite or I am a... Uh, Seminite or I am a Levite or whatever it might be 
they identified as that. But then when it came to holy things and when it came to God, they identified themselves as Israelites. So they, as, as a part of that, uh, the kingdom of God, they, they, it was a small circle and it was one of those things that they were able to say it that way. Whereas uh, in our trying to bring that forward is like the idea the people that first moved to Ohio either thought of themselves as from one of the states that they came from. So the saver for Virginia and migrated to Kentucky. So they still thought of themselves as Virginians. They didn't think of Kentucky as a part of America. And then what it is is over time, we've we got to where we thought, you know, whether it be the state of Washington or California or Maine or Georgia, no, those we all think of ourselves first if you ask us you know I'm an American but that's only we only say that when we're talking to someone outside of that belt like someone that's outside of the states we, we would say I'm an American but then if you asked uh, if you'd asked me when I was growing up or even after high school and stuff when I when I first got married if you asked me who I where I was from or what I was I would say I was from Ohio and I was an Ohioan or a Buckeye. And uh, that's kind of what's happening here. This is breaking down from no longer are we, and, and I don't know that we ever had it really established in the beginning, but I don't think they ever thought of themselves as, uh, they thought it was the God of Israel, but I don't think they identified as Israelites. They identified as whichever group they belong to like we identify with which other state so if you were to ask me now and they say something you know well you know where are you from or what are you i would say that i'm an arkansan and it's kind of just that way but then if i was like say in canada and i would say i was an american but i live in arkansas you know it's like it's it's kind of weird how that all, but there's a mental part of that too that i'm trying to uh <laughs> trying to kind of pull out of this text it's like one of those things they did not think of themselves as we are we belong to the kingdom of israel they i am a part of the tribe of manasseh you know or i'm part of the tribe of zebulon it was like that that was how they identify themselves and even maybe down to a different section of that like uh if you uh kind of growing up in different things my thing is I would be Ohio to Cincinnati area to the between Cincinnati and Dayton and Middletown and then in the township that I grew up in. So it's kind of like uh, we have all of those different markers and we break it down closer. And then I would say that my family, you know, my neighborhood and my family and then and then my immediate family, you know, extended family, immediate family as they break down into that different things and, and we identify that way. And that was what was, that was making it very difficult for them to be able to protect themselves because this group did not think that what was happening over here, say if the Philistines were, were messing with this part of the, of the country, they did not, they said, well, that is a, an Edomite problem or that is an Ephraim problem or that is a, you know, whoever it was, whatever outside source, but these people over here did not think that that was their problem. So that's kind of what happened. And then as time goes on, the, the kingdom divides and the 10 tribes to the north are Israel and the two tribes to the south are uh, Judah and Benjamin become Judah. And uh, the, the, the first one falls, the first part of the kingdom falls and then Judah kind of stands back and says, well, you know, that's their problem up there. And then all of a sudden the next thing is the next wave and Egypt and, and Babylon and all that kind of stuff. And there's like there, that whole battle. Uh, the Assyrians, I believe, maybe the, the Persians, the Assyrian, Assyrians, I guess it is, take the northern kingdom. And then a few hundred years later, Judah falls to Nebuchadnezzar and all of that falls to Nebuchadnezzar at one time. And, uh, and, and it's, it's amazing to see how they did not identify with, by identifying as an Israelite, you identify with God. That's like being American, you identify, you should, 
No, I said not you should. You, most likely, if you're a generation back or even farther than that, as an American, you identify as a Christian. As a Christian nation, a Christian... I would say that probably Israel and all of those tribes, they identified as God's people and they identified as Israelites in that sense. But they did not hold true to the, to the commands and, the, and, and what it meant to be unified and to be together. Okay, I think this is kind of gone in all kinds of crazy quick actions, but I hope that makes a little bit of sense. If, if it doesn't, uh, I apologize. But the thing is, I hope that God will open your eyes to that. It's like we must identify as Christ-centered people and not worry so much about whether we are Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Jehovah Witness. I mean, I'm, this might be stretching the circle a little bit uh, as far as faith groups. But um, I think that there's, I would say that God works things out. And I think that there are Mormons that are probably going to go to heaven. In my opinion, it's like a kind of, that makes me kind of nervous. And in, in the sense that I think that God's grace is sufficient to be able to pull those folks in from outside of what we might consider mainline or what we might consider to be, you know, whether Lutheran or Presbyterian or Episcopalian, uh, more of the mainline churches. Uh, some of our outliers, some of the ones that are independent, some of our, our different, more charismatic churches and different things like that, uh, we tend to draw those lines. And I think that it's a shame that we can't be better at being and identifying as God's people and, and not worrying about all these little names and numbers and, and distinctions that uh, really are irrelevant. They're, they're not scriptural. Denominations are not scriptural. There's only one church, one God, one baptism. Uh, you know, it's like scripture tells us over and over about that. So uh, I'm kind of, I, I don't know if you can go along with me as far as the, the idea of all of that, but it's like one of those things that I would say, as we enter into the book of Judges, we're changing. We're changing from the perception of, of, of an entire people that were being brought out as the Exodus out of the land of Egypt and they're turning into denominations and breaking down into different groups, uh, you know. And then eventually we get to where these people worship in Shiloh, these people worship in Jerusalem. Now, which is the right one? Which is the kingdom that? And it's like Jesus comes along and tells the lady at the well, right, or the woman at the well. He tells her it doesn't matter because God's spirit is everywhere. So wherever you choose to worship God and ask for God's presence to be with you, that's where God will be and God will be with you. So uh, we'll, we'll work through this and, and kind of go that way. But uh, I think I've taken up enough of your time this morning and I uh, want to finish up with prayer. And this is the second chapter of Judges. And uh, I want to ask for your prayers and thoughts. I. I went and seen the uh, new cardiologist yesterday. They were getting some records together. In about a month, I have to go and check in and see um, like a telehealth thing. So I'm going to covet that prayers for myself as I continue to improve. Uh, my leg feels much better. Uh, the medicine and different things that they've done. And now we're going to that next step uh, for a vascular uh, visit and, and the procedure so uh, don't have any of the details of that yet but I would like to ask for your prayers for that as well I want to pray for my family ask for prayers for that I was going to say uh, Maddie is uh, now I guess we're into the eighth month of her pregnancy uh, we're expecting our our new our grandbaby to be uh, Isabella to be born uh, around circa as they say, around uh, November the 2nd, and uh, we're looking forward to her. Her room is ready. Her place to sleep and to be is ready. It includes the rocker recliner kind of deal that's there and uh, for her to be uh, rocked to sleep and for her to be comforted and uh, the things that go on with little babies and all that kind of stuff. It's been a while since mine, uh, as I say, my son, it's been nearly 30 years and he's the youngest so uh pretty excited and uh you know to hear the the voice of, of a small next generation kind of thing going on so 
Um, well, I'll end with that. And as I say, we have, if you got the newsletter yesterday, we have the list that's there. We want to pray for those folks. Uh, I have Courtney uh, Turner on my uh, on my mind and everything. So we want to pray that her condition and, and that prayers for her and her health and recovery and healing uh, would be just placed upon her in that way that it would be done. I, uh, I, again, thank you for allowing me to share God's word with you each day, Monday through Friday, as best and as close to that uh, 10 o'clock mark as we can. Uh, just be careful, be safe, and and just focus in on God and, and be good to somebody today and to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many gifts and blessings. As we come to you in prayer, we ask for healing of our minds, our bodies, and souls, knowing that those persons that are dealing with different situations and different problems, but we do know that we want to lift them up for emotional, physical, and spiritual need, that you would be there with them in their time of recovery, their time of, of, of healing, their time of need, and that you would be a blessing and comfort to them in that those, those special times and events. We pray for our, our students. We pray for their safety. We pray for our community. And we pray for those who have suffered gun violence, those who have lost lives and lost loved ones, that they would be lifted up. As we go into this time of remembrance of our, of our uh, ancestors, the, the pillars and the foundation of our churches, our communities, and our families, we lift them up to you. And we lift up the fact that we praise you for the fact that they are there with you in a, in a place that is heavenly, a place that is eternal, a place where there's no pain or suffering or crying. And we just thank you that, that you are with us as we go about this mortal life and look forward to that eternal one that comes with knowing you as our personal savior and knowing that we are part of a kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And we are so proud of who you are and what you have done for us. And we are so thankful for what you have made possible for us. Bless this time together, this reading of your word, and in your name we pray. And we ask all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless you and keep you, and uh, we'll talk to you uh, sometime soon. So uh, keep uh, just doing what you're doing and do it in the name of Christ. And, and keep an open mind and open heart. And uh, let us always have our doors open to uh, visitors, whether it be the orphan, the, the, uh, the widow, or the, the, the stranger, or the foreigner, that we would be able to do that and be welcoming and mean what the sign says, welcome to our church, God's church.